Hey, Dog Nation, I'm Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. Hope you all had a great weekend. Thought we had a great Friday. Uh, getting my vacation time started. We kind of roll back into a new week here, there as well. Really appreciate you being a part of what we're doing as we get you ready for Georgia spring practice, continuing to look at some of the other action around the rest of the SEC, more player movement than almost ever before. And so just staying on top of that, taking some time right now while I'm away and enjoying my Royal Caribbean cruise uh, it feels like a good time to do all of that. So we'll do that on the program today. John Stinchcomb stops by today. We'll get some great offensive line stuff from John, looking at how that group may look going into the start of uh, spring practice. I'm actually really excited about that with uh, John. We'll do that coming up in a few minutes' time here today. But I want to begin with this. There is an area in which I think that Georgia was merely good a year ago. An offensive line kind of plays in this discussion. But it's an area in which I think that Georgia was merely good a year ago, which if it could find its way back into the category of great, which may not be as hard to do as maybe you might think, if Georgia can do that, then believe it or not, it might be even better this year than it was in its national championship season of a year ago. Does that sound like a pretty good place to have a conversation here today? So what do you say we do that right now? It's Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. It's presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, viewed to be the best. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. I've told you before that I'm a little bit of a natural contrarian thinker. In that, um, I just have a tendency when I hear a lot of people saying one thing or when I see the tide moving in one direction, there's just a natural tendency on my part. Maybe I do this in some cases intentionally, but a lot of cases I just think it's an instinct that I have where I begin to be pretty curious about how the area in which most people aren't going, how that might be a little closer to the truth. That might be an area we ought to consider there for a moment. And I think there is an example of that when it comes to Georgia for this upcoming season. Because there is a conventional wisdom out there. Take a look at the way too early top 25s. Take a look at a lot of the chatter that already exists on the internet about what college football is going to be for the upcoming season. There is a conventional wisdom that exists that Georgia won the national championship last season and may be due for a little bit of a step back here this season. That's just kind of what seems to be out there. You don't really see anybody right now naming Georgia as the preseason number one for the upcoming year. Alabama seems to be getting a lot of that. Ohio State seems to be generating a lot of talk right now. And there just seems to be a little bit of an absence of Georgia chatter in that regard. Now, we said the same thing last offseason, and eventually you saw some people start to come around. Remember, we had Peter Burns on the show from the SEC Network. He'd made the case for Georgia winning the national championship. That eventually we got to the point where we were hearing some people talking up Georgia, but it took us a while to get there. Thus far, kind of the same thing. Maybe eventually we get there heading into 2022 where some folks step up and say, I think Georgia repeats. Thus far, not a lot of folks have come out on the record to to say that. And it's understandable why that'd be the case. We have not had a repeat national champion since what Alabama in 2011 and 2012. It's been kind of a while here now, basically a full decade since since somebody's won back to back national championships. So the tasks task is certainly hard for Georgia, and conventional wisdom seems to be the task might be too hard for Georgia here this year when it comes to to getting that done. However, as I said before, there is a natural tendency on my part to be contrarian that when everybody's saying ah. Yeah, Georgia may be, you know, they may win the East again. They may be back in the playoff conversation again, but they're not going to win it all again. There's a, I think, a natural tendency on my part to say, well, maybe, maybe there's something that people aren't considering. Maybe there is an opportunity that exists for UGA that hasn't gotten its full uh, attention the way that it possibly should. And if that is true, let me tell you where I believe that opportunity, what it kind of centers around. For me, it centers around the running back position for Georgia and a chance to regain something for the dogs they probably hadn't had in a little bit of time and maybe haven't fully considered how long it's been since, they, since they've since they had it. Let's go back history lesson and it'll lead us to the, the point I want to get to right here. If we want to go back to last August, this is just before the season began, Kirby Smart was asked at the time to talk a little bit the fact about the fact that 
you were not really seeing a lot of explosive runs from Georgia. That 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 the big, you know, exciting run that maybe like Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle had made the hallmark of their Georgia career, and certainly DeAndre Swift had had plenty of. That in 2020, you just hadn't seen a lot of those from Georgia. And Kirby Smart was asked to give his assessment of maybe why that was the case. So if we're going to talk about the running game and the opportunity that exists for Georgia to kind of add to that to maybe defend its national title in 2022, let's go back and think about what Kirby Smart was saying about the running game just before the start of the 2021 season. This is from last August. I don't think our backs are any less talented last year or this year in terms of being able to have explosive runs. Uh, we haven't had as many, and you have to say, okay, well, why is that? And a lot of it has to do with the way people are playing us. Um, how can we make them pay for playing us with extra people? And then how can we block their extra people at the second level? We've had probably just as many seven, eight, nine yard, yard runs, but we haven't had the explosive we've had in the past. Most people would point to sheer speed of the backs, but that that's that's not the case with our, our guys are you know just as fast now as they were when we had uh, the other guys. We haven't been as explosive, and a lot of that is breaking tackles on the second level and being able to block downfield, you know, get the second hit. So that's Kirby Smart saying, hey, this is why I think maybe in 2020 we didn't have a lot of explosive runs, and that led into the start of the 2021 season, which, you know, Georgia beat Clemson week one, and Georgia had the record-setting performance by Stetson Bennett in the home opener week two and blowing out UAB. But the overall stat line for Georgia running backs at the time you know, they didn't look that great. That that you know, they didn't have maybe a, a big day against the Blazers. And you know, while it was important in leading to the victory against Clemson, and we'll get there in a moment, that the overall stat line, really for the Georgia offense entirely, but the running backs included, just wasn't all that great uh, versus the Tigers there in Week One. So Kirby Smart, after that Week Two game against UAB, as kind of a continuation of what he'd said there in August, did kind of acknowledge that yeah, we wouldn't mind having a little more from our running game than what we're getting right now. Kind of an honest assessment from Smart near the beginning of last season. Let's take a listen to it. You got to do it better. Like, you can't, you can't do that. Now, we may not have our running back get you know, over 100, but that could happen because we may split them up. You know, we may share it out. But certainly would have thought we'd have had more with over than 34 and, and should. Uh, and we got to work hard at that. We've got to be able to create run game. Uh, some of our uh, passing game comes from the the run game, right? The play action. So your play action is not going to be real good if you're not a good run team. That's part of the success we have on defense is we don't have to honor play action because we got a good run defense. So we got to be able to make that a threat. We got to be able to make that count and hit people. And we did not we did not do that at a high rate. Now, how much I had to do with UAB and how much I had to do with us, you know, I, I don't know. I still. I think UAB has a pretty good team and a pretty good defense, um, but we did hit them with some explosives. Let me give you a little bit of a statistical point to back up what Smart says there in the first clip from August and the clip you just heard after the UAB game, that over the course of the last three years, now Smart didn't know this when he was saying that, but this season for Georgia was a little bit of a continuation of a trend that's been in place now for a couple of years. Georgia was fifth in the SEC in rushing yards per game here this season after having only been sixth in the SEC in that stat in 2020. And folks, go back to 2019 for a moment, and this is where I think some things get lost on some Georgia fans at some point in time, that I think a lot of Georgia fans think, well, you know, once DeAndre Swift left this program, once there was no, you know, uh, 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 Nick Chubb, Sonny Michelle, that the Georgia running game suffered because of that. But the actual truth is, is there was a very big statistical drop off in the 2019 season there as well. Georgia had two first round offensive tackles, had DeAndre Swift at running back. Solomon Kinley also, you know, goes on to the NFL. Georgia seemingly had everything it wanted from the offensive line and the kind of running back that could have gotten big totals. But Georgia was also only fifth in the SEC in rushing yards per game in 2019 there a, a, as well. That at a certain point, the Georgia rushing attack had just kind of fallen off from where it had been before. That Georgia was number one in the SEC in rushing yards per game in 2018 and certainly was number one in the SEC in rushing yards per game in 2017. But somewhere that sort of started to change. And it's not a change that completely coincided with personnel changes because Georgia still had you know, Sam Pittman in place in 2019 and a huge collection of future first-round talents along the offensive line and a great back like Swift, but the but the – but the numbers started to go down. And I think that the predictability of the Georgia offense in 2019 caused that to suffer. And I think the 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 
you know, any number of things could have also been the issue there in, in 2020. But it's not simply a matter of personnel change and the results went down because when the personnel was still seemingly pretty strong in 2019, the numbers had kind of also started to subside. So the point here is, is that when Smart addresses in August a lack of explosive runs, the kind of things that lead to big stats and maybe some frustration about some lack of, you know, dominant rushing performances in the first couple of games of uh, this season, he's speaking about something that had at that point actually been a a little bit of a multi-year trend for UGA. And to bring this back to what I said off the top of the program, so when you start looking at ways in which Georgia can be maybe even better in 2022 than it was in its national championship season of 2021, there are a lot of areas which that can be hard to do. Hard to match with Georgia did defensively, for instance. But don't you think that Georgia can match, if not exceed, what it did with its rushing attack? For a program that's just really not that far removed from having the best rushing attack in the SEC back-to-back years in 2017, 2018, getting a little closer to that in 2022 – doesn't that seem like it's at least a, a little bit of a possibility? Now, I realize that James Cook's no longer here. We know how big Cook was. Zamir White is no longer here. We know what kind of career he had there for UGA. But talent would not seem to be an issue for Georgia at the running back spot. As you look ahead to spring practice and as you start to think ahead to the start of the upcoming season, talent does not seem to be the issue. Much the same way that the best Georgia teams that are smart have kind of had that tandem of backs. Cook and Zamir this past year, Uh, Elijah Holyfield, DeAndre Swift at one point in time, certainly Chubb and Michelle. You know, maybe it's Kenny McIntosh and Kendall Milton's turn to be that. Maybe Branson Robinson's a part of this discussion. Dejon Edwards is a guy that seems to be in line for some more carries there as well. That that somehow, some way, talent does not seem to be the issue that is maybe holding the Georgia offense back. At one point in time, maybe the offense was just too predictable, or maybe there were some offensive line issues, or maybe whatever else. But talent within the running back room does not necessarily seem to be the problem. So if you want to talk about Georgia maybe blowing a lid off of and exceeding its 2021 performance, I would say the running back position is one of the best spots that can happen. Now, let me give you one more thing to think about. It's clearly not likely that Georgia goes back to like a Chubb, Michelle level of rushing. The team probably throws the ball a little bit more than it used to and any number of reasons. But in terms of continuing to get better in that regard, better offensive line, better running back stats, everything like that, I mean, there is some reason to believe that could be true. Because, look, what happened in the college football playoff? You know, Georgia, you know, averaged more than five yards a carry and rushed for 190 yards in the, in the dominant win against Michigan, probably a little less than that in the game against uh, Alabama. But still, you know, there were some moments there as well. And in the midst of a time at the beginning of the 2021 season, when a lot of folks were asking questions that Smart was forced to answer, Smart would still have some confidence in all of that. And if you want to go back and look at the Clemson game here for a moment, this is a game in which the Georgia offense clearly scuffled. The only touchdown of that game was scored by the Georgia defense. The Christopher Smith interception was obviously the, the signature play there of that game. But Smart, even though it was a game that did not feature an offensive touchdown, still gave his rushing attack credit for what it did late in the game when you had to move the chains, when you had to get first downs, when you had to make that happen. Smart was ready to acknowledge the work that Zamir White did and a little bit of James Cook there as well in terms of getting that done. So even at a time in which media folks and fans were kind of wondering, hey, what is going on with the Georgia rushing attack and what happened to the days in which this was the best in the SEC? At the time, Smart seemed to, to to be okay with some of that and in a way it almost foreshadows the success that Georgia eventually had along the way to winning last year's national championship so smart's confidence even during a time in which things did not seem to be going very well maybe that leads to a little bit of confidence that we can also have in Georgia here right now this is smart from after the Clemson game you know when our offense had to convert when our offense had to force the ball down somebody's throat a pretty good defense you know, they were able to do it, and uh, that makes me proud. But we certainly have a long way to go um, to be explosive and, and get where we need to go offensively. So that level of confidence there of, hey, we may not be putting them up statistically the way we have before, but but we had to against Clemson, a team that was ranked the top 10, healthy, one of the best defense in the country. We had to move the chains and, and hold on to that lead and run that clock and get you know get that game to the, to, to the end there. Georgia rushing attack was able to step up and do that. And you know what? When it was also called upon to, to be big in the Michigan game, to get Georgia to a national championship game, it got it done there as well. And it had some moments against Alabama in the national championship game there too. 
but the door would also seem to be open for an even better level of performance here in this next season because the Todd Munkin offense is that much more fully filled out. All of a sudden now defenses are put in more conflict about is this team going to throw it? Is this team going to run it? Not nearly as predictable as it would have been in the past. And maybe for an offensive line that much like the rushing attack was maybe good, not great a year ago, maybe it's ready to take that next step forward there as well. So let's just say a portion of what I'm saying right now turns out to be true. Let's say that Georgia is a little bit better with its rushing attack here this season. When you add that to all the other things with Todd Monk, and that is working pretty well right now, Brock Bowers and so many other things involved with the passing attack, how much better does that give the Georgia offense a, a, a chance to be? It's kind of fun to let your mind wander uh, with that a bit. That If you could add the more potent rushing attack to go along with an offense that was already scoring about a 40-point-per-game clip a year ago, that could make the dogs awful fun to watch here in 2022. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, and it's great to have you with us. Now, normally we do the show starting at 945 on the dognation.com homepage and the Dog Nation app. We call it our first and 15. Right now, I'm not doing that this week because I am taking a little bit of vacation, which I'm very excited about being able to do, but we really appreciate you joining us for that normally and on all of our other video platforms here today, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, every day, 10 a.m., of course, podcasts, all the podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, everything else. The radio at noon on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref. Just really appreciate you being with us for all of what we're doing here around Dog Nation Daily. And certainly appreciate our friends at Pella Window and Door of Georgia for making it all possible. You know, they can help equip your house with energy-efficient windows and doors. That's important. Making your house look better on the outside, making it feel better on the inside. Pella Window and Door of Georgia is great for doing all of that uh, for you. We're in a time of year where... Listen, it's still pretty cold at night, and that means you've got a lot of energy you want to keep inside your house. Expensive heat, you don't want that creeping out the crevices of poorly fitted windows and doors or windows and doors that have just kind of gotten old and weathered and worn. You don't want that. That's why you want Pella Window and Door, George. It's a recognized brand. Homeowners in the Atlanta area have been trusting it and recommending it for such a long time, and we do that here there as well. So I wanted you to get in touch. It's PellaofGA.com slash DogNation. That's PellaofGA.com slash DogNation. Or you can give them a call, 678-638-1496. That's 678-638-1496. And make sure you tell them the BA from Dog Nation Daily sent you to them because I know they are going to take good care of you. Pella Window and Door of Georgia bringing Dog Nation Daily to you today, and they are viewed to be the best. So I start today's program by saying, I think the door is open for the Georgia rushing attack to be better in 2022 than it was in 2021, potentially aiding Georgia towards a defense of its national championship here for this upcoming season. If that's going to be true, you probably also need another step forward for the offensive line. A couple of bedrock members that you know you can count on there with that group. A couple of young guys who could be very much on their way. And some fun considerations as well of who might truly emerge as a starter for that group here for this upcoming season. There is no better person to talk about with all of that than John Stinchcomb. It is a great preview of what is eventually going to happen for the dogs during spring practice. So here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Window and Door of Georgia. What do you say we do that right now? From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Fun to be able to take a little vacation time here, but also great to have some shows while we're doing that and a great time here, kind of pre-spring practice, to also get going with what the dog's going to look like on the field for the upcoming season. Of course, you're going to look at the Georgia offensive line. No better person to do that with than John Stinchcomb here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Window and Door of Georgia. John, thanks for uh, being with us here, and thanks for helping us look ahead to the upcoming spring practice. Uh, obviously, a lot of that conversation about what the dog's going to be here in 2022 going to center around the position that you know very well along the offensive line. Well, hopefully it's a major strength for the dogs because of the number of returning uh, starters and contributors and those that we only saw small flashes yeah. of, and speaking specifically about Tate Ratledge there. But yeah. uh, Georgia's done a great job of creating numbers in that space. And uh, when you lose a, a talent like Salyer and, and Schaefer, who's been a contributor for a number of years as well, 
most teams would be scrambling, but Georgia certainly doesn't find themselves in that position. So let's talk about this, maybe sort of divide this into knowns and unknowns for a moment. Let's start with the knowns. I think there are two things you can say with pretty strong certainty here, or a thing about two guys that you can say with real strong certainty here, that Cedric Von Prahn is your center and Warren McLennan is your right tackle. Those are bedrock members of this offensive line. Those are by any measure, two of the best offensive linemen in the SEC. Those are the kinds of guys, the component pieces that if you're looking to build an elite offensive line around, you got to have some just some rubber stamp givens. And in the case of SVP and McClendon, they seem to fit the bill of being that, and I'm sure you agree. I, I think it's a huge uh, foundational rock to start from. Uh, McClendon's been a guy that has silently put together a, a pair of years that um, – I, I think is some of the best in in the SEC, which is saying something with the amount of talent that you see on a week in week out basis, and continues to get better. I mean, he's been a guy that came in and, and originally was battling with Owen Condon for that spot, and once he uh, got hold of that position, he hadn't let it go, and has has only improved and put together quite the body of work. And the same thing can be said for Cedric Von Prahn in, in the middle, in that. Um, you know, I think it, the door opened in training camp when there was a hand injury to Warren McClendon and, um, Cedric gets the opportunity to come in there and plays at such a, a great level and is another guy that only got better. So two, two guys that you're going to need to count on as, as you start this, uh, 2022 campaign and what better ways to do it than, uh, with some national championship level playing uh players at, at some two primary spots you mentioned tate rattledge a moment ago that kind of moves into the category of somewhat of an unknown but man i think the promise here is really intriguing in that had rattledge stayed healthy last season i think he was going to be one of georgia's five best offensive linemen and i think he was actually setting up for a very good year and ultimately his injury to me, I would say it this way. That maybe cost Georgia the chance to have a great offensive line. I thought Georgia was good in 2021, and it clearly got the job done. They won the national championship. But it was probably not at the same level that the offensive line play may have been in 2017 or certainly 2018, which I think is probably the best single season offensive line performance under Kirby Smart. The 2021 offensive line was maybe a, a step below that, and I think a healthy Ratledge may have been the difference there. How important do you think him coming back is, being healthy, earning a starting spot again at maybe one of the guard spots? How important do you think that is in terms of – as you said before, hey, you hope this is an overwhelming strength for UGA. To me, the return of Ratledge healthy is a big question to be answered along the way to getting that done. Do you agree with that? I think the ceiling for this year's offensive line group is much higher than what we had in 2021, and, and Tate Ratledge is a big piece of that. I think uh, losing him early in the season hurt, and, and you had to shuffle some guys around and um, – it was. I, I'm grateful that other folks were able to get the experience and some of that playing time. But um, all reports coming out early in the in the year was that Tate was on the verge of of staking his claim for a long time at one of those interior spots. Um, so to have him back, I think is going to be a real boost for this team. I think there's a number of guys as you start working out from there that have had a, a number of reps and, and you see that depth and um, it's setting itself up for uh, a lot of healthy competition among some really good players. So let me talk left tackle here for a moment because I think for a lot of folks they say, hey, what you saw in the national championship game, the emergence of Broderick Jones after he had been you know, really in line for some playing time throughout the 2021 season, but called upon in a big moment when Georgia had to have, you know, improved play from its offensive line. That was one of the coaching adjustments that Smart probably made in-game in the national championship game that contributed to that victory, maybe as much as anything else. The insertion of Broderick Jones there, moving Jamari Sire back into uh, the guard position, and now with left tackle seemingly open for the upcoming year, a lot of folks wonder, well, does this mean that Broderick Jones has actually kind of put a stranglehold on that position because he's the guy that had a chance to do that in the national championship game how true do you think that is that what we saw against Alabama in Indianapolis in January is the precursor for the upcoming season for Broderick well you know all names are written in pencil at this point in the season because you want the competition but 
um, that first name at the left tackle spot that's written down is going to be Broderick Jones. I think you look at his uh, body type and, and his performance when he was called upon on literally the biggest stage possible uh, in, in college football. And he came in and, and very much answered the call. So right now it, it's his position to lose. And what's good is I think what Georgia has created is a, is a high floor situation. So, you know there there are some known commodities on the table. Cedric Ron Pran, obviously McClendon, Roderick Jones has had a number of reps even during the season because of injuries to, to Salyer. Um, but he's not alone. I mean, Xavier Trust got a number of reps. Amarius Mims in, in certain situations had come in. So uh, a number of tackles that uh, you could pull from and, and – work and get reps for and let the best man win is a is ideal situation for Georgia. You like the competition, you want to push each other. Um, and that's some of the more established, if you will, younger players. Um, and there, there's still more names out there. I mean, this is a position group that has 20 plus um, right now that are on campus with Drew, Bro- Drew Bobo being the, the lone um uh, scholarship player that that isn't in town yet, uh, but what is it? Twenty guys. There's twenty guys on the offensive line, and then most of those names. Uh, anybody who who followed Georgia recruiting, you can recognize three out of four of them. Sure. So uh, a really talented pool to pull from, and a position group that you know I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that you're trying to find ways to get maybe six on the field, but geez, with that tight end room it's tough to to pull one of those guys out but i think if georgia could play with uh three tight ends and six offensive linemen on the field they might want to consider it just because of the number of of capable bodies they have in those position groups i think that's an interesting point and you mentioned marius mims and to me he's as intriguing as anybody will talk about in this preseason chatter about the offensive line for a couple of reasons first of all that's a big time prospect and if you're a georgia fan thinking about having your five best you're intrigued of maybe mims is one of those guys but on the other hand just simply of the evaluation of mims you know while he got a chance to play some, did not play a ton last year, which is not a huge deal when you're one year removed from high school. But now mm-hmm. when you move into 2022, it's now two years removed from high school when you are the caliber of prospect that Mims was. I think there's a certain sense that many fans have, you know, folks who kind of do this for a living, talk you know, about this team for a living, are kind of also thinking some of the same stuff of, okay, now it's really time to see what you have in terms of Marius Mims. And to me, that comes down to a handful of possibilities that maybe he actually – even though Broderick Jones was ahead of him at the end of last year, maybe Mims actually overtakes Jones at some point in time in this preseason process, be it spring, summer, whatever else, and actually he emerges as your left tackle because that's the kind of talent that he is. Or maybe it's a five-best situation where even though he's probably a tackle, I think most people would say that he is, for now you use him at guard just because you want him on the field somewhere. I guess there's also the chance that we've seen former five-star guys, whether it be you know Cade Mays a long time ago or Jamari Salyer not – quite so long ago but the former five-star guy that kind of becomes the super sixth man type thing where you're the key backup at, at every position maybe maybe Mims is in that role here in the 2022 season one way or another though I do think it's kind of time to find out what you have in Amarius Mims at least at some position or at least in some pretty important role the best version of Georgia I think has to include a lot of Mims well, I, I would hope so. I mean, you, what we've seen of him so far, uh, big, powerful, moves well, athletic. So the, the competition, if, if given the opportunity at tackle, I mean, you look at it and that's three guys that, that you want to get on the field. I think most teams, and I'm the three being Robert Jones, McClendon, and Mims, you, most teams would – kill to have the opportunity to have one of them on the on their roster so to have all three um i think is is a real advantage and and you're going to have some healthy competition they're going to push each other to to get better and uh amens uh amarius has shown that he's got the 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 capability to develop in one of to into one of those guys that that is you know a, a marquee cornerstone 
um, just hadn't really had that opportunity yet. And, and that's a good thing. I think he's been able to develop behind the scenes, but there does come a point in, in um, the process where it's time for you to get out there. And, you know, there's some roster shuffling that's, that's going to need to happen. Just looking at overall numbers and I, you know, I, I don't think it's any of those guys that we're talking about, but I'd be surprised if, if, you're heading into August and the same 21 scholarship uh, offensive linemen are, are, are on this roster. I, I wouldn't doubt that, you know, that somebody sees a, a better opportunity elsewhere. Maybe that comes after spring, but it's, it's so chock full. I mean, I, I don't, I, th- this is the most loaded position group on the team. There's a number of, of guys that I would think, um, there's probably better opportunities and maybe they, they see it and spring ball happens and they're going, Hmm, uh, maybe the, the grass is actually greener somewhere else for them. And in today's game, that's a very realistic possibility of, of just the shuffle, if you will, because, uh, you know, the names that we've listed, they all are, in my opinion, starter caliber. And there's, uh, 10 more guys that we could talk about that in a normal situation would be in the discussion for, you know, who's filling the roles of, yeah. of Schaefer and Salyer as they uh, have moved on. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And obviously we can't talk about all those, but I do want to address two more with you before we let you go and make this kind of the final thing that, you know, if you look at, you know, the, the next names discussed, it's guys like Xavier Truss and probably Warren Erickson, guys we have seen on the field. And to be frank, John, you know, maybe mixed results at times on the field. And I think that has left a lot of Georgia fans mm-hmm. wondering, well, you know, you know, what does a, a trust potentially provide for UGA? What does an Erickson potentially provide for UGA based on the fact that it hasn't always been perfect for those guys when they have been on the field? So I'll, I'll you know, uh, lay this, you know, to you and let you answer. What do you think that Warren Erickson can still give UGA? And same thing for Xavier Truss. Right. And, and Warren's been a guy, you talk about having a lot of field experience mm-hmm. at, at a variety of interior spots. Warren has been able to plug in at center and guard uh, both sides and, and contribute. And, you know, he's taken his lumps. It was one of those, he gets injured uh, in the national championship game and um, they, they end up rotating, but you, you can't deny the fact that um, the production certainly did increase when Salyer moved to the inside and Broderick came to tackle. So, um, right now, if, if I'm being candid, I think the, a fair assessment of him is that he, he's a, a plug and play player that has a little bit lower ceiling than some of the, the other top talent guys in that position group room that if needed, he's gonna, he's gonna be more than serviceable, but just doesn't have that, uh, same high ceiling as some of the other talent in the room. So, um, would you would you feel comfortable with him uh, as your starter going into a game? Yes, but um, I would expect that there would be a lot of competition, and you'd probably feel better going into the year as, as him uh, being that sixth or seventh offensive lineman that comes onto the field when when needed and as as situations dictate, most likely because of injury. Um, Xavier Trust, I think, is a guy that. Uh, you, we're talking about Mims of just trying to find ways to get him on the field. Uh, Xavier, just body type alone, I think is a better fit at tackle, and probably because of you know his effort, production, his knowledge of the system, uh, they tried to find ways to get him on the field as, and and have been able to do so better on the interior than at tackle. So, um, another guy that is capable probably in other systems would would already have a tackle spot but when you have Salyer and, and McClendon um he was he was a, a guy that's like all right well if, if there's not a clear opening there maybe we can get him more reps on the interior so um again probably more of your reserve uh wasn't an like a in my opinion a natural fit on the inside um but productive that you want and you trust uh, once they get on the field 
John, great stuff. Great look at what this offensive line is going to look like as we head towards spring practice. And it's a great time of year to be doing all of that. Thanks for spending some time with us here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of George. And we will look forward to be talking to you back live again here very soon there as well. So thanks for your time. Ah, looking forward to it. Go dogs. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Great to do a little uh, UG offensive line talk with John Stinchcomb there. Always a nice chance to catch up with him and hoping I'm also able to catch up with some of you coming up very soon on the Dog Nation cruise. Now, a lot of you know as we go cruise around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean that I'm on my own Royal Caribbean cruise right now, and that's really fun. But being on a cruise with all of you is going to be especially fun coming up the month of April. There's still some limited space to be a part of this. Sailing out of uh, Port Canaveral on April 25th on the gorgeous Independence of the Seas and Boy, that's going to be uh, amazing. Going to Perfect Day Coco Cay, being at NASA on the Bahamas, taking advantage of all the really cool things on board, Independence of the Seas. Uh, if you go to dognation.com, right at the top of the page, you can find out more about that and how amazing it's all going to be. I want to be there. Jeff Sintel's going to be there. Mike Griffith's going to be there. A lot of the Dog Nation folks are going to be there. And you can kind of see kind of what it's like to be around Dog Nation. You know, there's week of the NFL draft. We'll probably end up doing some kind of fun for that. You can kind of watch. You can watch Mike write about it. You can just uh, have all kinds of uh, good, fun stuff. But it's really going to be a good time. I'm I'm joking, but it's going to be an amazingly fun time as we just experience everything that Royal Caribbean has to offer. And, boy, what a great time it is to be on a Royal Caribbean cruise ship. So Dog Nation Cruise, you can find out more about that at dognation.com. Our friends the Cruise and Vacation Authority, of course, got all of that. If we're booking a cruise like this, we're using the Cruise and Vacation Authority to do that, and they're helping us get ready to be on the uh, high seas coming up very soon tcava.com 770-952-8300 but the dog nation cruise all the information you need right at the top of the page at dognation.com it's going to be a great great time all right speaking of cruise around the sec let's do that right now with royal caribbean and we'll continue our look at the sec for the upcoming season kind of a snapshot post signing day pre-spring about what everybody's bringing to the table here and I want to look at the Kentucky Wildcats here just for a moment because there's a distinction that Kentucky had last season that I think is probably worth your attention a little bit. Maybe this isn't as interesting to you as it is to me, but let me show you a quick snapshot of kind of where things are with the Wildcats. 10-3 and three a year ago, that, of course, pretty impressive. But what's more impressive to me on that, look at that 6-2 and two mark in the league. There were only a small number of teams in the SEC that won more than – you know, four games last year in league play. Big glut of teams at four and four, but only a small number of teams got above that into that, like, say, five, six, or, or seven win category, and Kentucky was one of those. So if you're thinking about Kentucky being able to maintain some of that for the upcoming season, and the fact that they did so much what they did against league foes is maybe an example of that. And there's also the chance that here in the very near future, maybe by the time you're hearing this, it's already happened. We're obviously pre recording this, but Liam Cohen. The offensive coordinator who was you know well regarded in his first season he could be heading back to the nfl and frankly heading back to his old job old team with the los angeles rams but but when you think about kentucky's chance for maintaining some of that momentum what they did in league play in particular last year maybe an example of of why that maybe could continue if you're curious about the recruiting 24th last season or should say for the 2022 cycle according to the 24 7 sports composite and 22nd when it comes to preseason SP Plus from Bill Conley at ESPN.com. So a little bit of a step back there in relationship to that. Can I see those portal additions one more time? So you bring in Javon Baker, that's the wide receiver out of uh, Alabama. Deshaun Manning, that's a former Auburn defensive lineman. So there's a couple of the additions that Auburn brings into the, I should say that Kentucky brings into the program. But obviously for a guy like Mark Stoops has really kind of proven himself to be a thorn in the side of a lot of teams in the SEC, and maybe at some point, maybe even better than that. Uh, Those numbers suggest that's maybe maybe a bit possible. I think, you know, yesterday on the show, going back to Friday's show, we made the comparison between, like, say, Florida, first year for Billy Napier. You know, it's the presence of a Mark Stoops at Kentucky, the the momentum that program's had over the course of the last couple of years that makes a debut season for a guy like Napier that much tougher. You know, Georgia is so far out in front that I don't know that that's much of a concern for Florida right now. But finding a way to be better than a team like Kentucky, remember, for a long time, Florida had a long winning streak against the Wildcats. That's kind of since come to an end. 
and it's really the presence of schools like uh, Kentucky that posed the biggest problem for a for a new coach like Napier when it comes to entering into the SEC East. Now, with that said, let's transition over, look at another team from the SEC West for a moment. Another one of these teams that wins a lot of games year one, uh, or should say in the SEC uh, last season. You know, Ole Miss all the way around. They put a 10-win squad together, but also finding a way to get a good number of wins in the SEC. Let's show you this on the screen here from when it comes to Ole Miss. Six and two in the league. To correct myself on one thing, I, I, I had the graphic wrong. Kentucky was actually five and three in the league a year ago, but Ole Miss was six and two in the league there last year. Once again, there were only four teams that had more than four conference wins last year. Georgia and Bama, Kentucky was one, Ole Miss was the other. So when you think about what Ole Miss did, the fact that they did a lot of this also in league play is an example of you know what ought to get your attention, which you ought to be you know you know paying you know pretty close attention to. Also, look at those key transfer additions: Jackson Dart, quarterback coming in from USC; Zach Evans, running back coming in from TCU. And you know Lane Kiffin's made no bones about this that that he wants to be a destination for transfers. I think in a lot of ways feels like that being a, a destination for elite recruits that's not working out so well. Kiffin kind of blames name, image, likeness payments as the reason why. I'm not quite so sure he is just a lazy recruiter. But one way or another, it's not working out great for Ole Miss when it comes to the high school part of all of this. But in terms of being a destination for recruits, they had the T-shirts of the day, transfer to the SIP, really kind of you know highlighting uh, you know themselves as a transfer destination. And the you know, person of Dart and, and Zach Evans, obviously another example of that kind of being true. In other words, this is the recipe that Lane Kiffin has fully embraced and fully uh, wants to be a part of here, using those transfers, much you know the same way they had some success with that in the past, but using those transfers as a way of building things up there at Ole Miss, trying to stay competitive in an SEC West that is getting more competitive by the day. So we will see how well that works out. But the presence of Dart, the presence of a guy like Evans at the running back position, and all those other transfers, they had a huge list of them that really they rolled them out at a big introductory press conference recently. This is it's a big part of what Ole Miss is right now, and we'll see how well that works out. We'll make that. Cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And by the way, let me also give you a quick update on some fun things going on at Marlowe's Tavern as Marlowe's becomes Marlowe's, not L-O-W-S, but L-E-A-U-X-S, Marlowe's Tavern, with the uh, great new uh, uh, Bayou and Bourbon Festival that's going on right now. Try all those great specialty menu items, the, the uh, ch- uh, chicken and shrimp gumbo, the deconstructed jambalaya, or a great dessert like the uh, honey bourbon bread pudding so many fun special menu items and of course there's always going to be crack cocktail favorites there too ongoing at your local marlowe's including the hurricane right now it would be new orleans without uh, a great tasting hurricane cocktail well marlowe's got a lot of that going on for you right now so make sure you check that out online at marlowe's tavern to enjoy the bayou and bourbon special event going on in the tavern right there in your neighborhood make sure you check that out today and hope you'll check this out there as well. Golden Shoe Time on our program. And we'll give another shout out to a great uh, piece of content that I've recently received. And we like doing this even during the time when I'm on vacation. So let's give you our Golden Shoe winner for today. Uh, we've been celebrating a lot of the folks who've been sharing the Top Dogs book and the folks who've had that delivered to them. Uh, JD Dogwalker shares this there as well. And he references my dad. Uh, and of course, my dad's Twitter account he shows there on the screen. Of course, I actually wrote about my father in the piece there at um at, at the uh, top dogs book and how much it would have meant to me to be able to share this moment with him and i appreciate uh, jd reaching out about that and kind of helping us promote the top dogs book so for those of you who've enjoyed that thank you for doing that and jd will make you a golden shoe winner for today lousy stinking gators speaking of them about four thousand seven hundred ninety two days since the uh, uh gators won a national title long title drop for them and gator hater countdown about 252 days Georgia back in Jacksonville beating Florida again. We will see you tomorrow. It's Dog Nation Daily presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We'll look forward to talking to you then. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews cool down. Of course, R.S. Andrews is the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. Hopefully we're not missing too much breaking news while we're gone, but if we do, we'll obviously deliver that to you once we get back. Uh, we'll be live again starting next Monday, but for now, enjoying a little bit of vacation time. So at that point in time, I will look forward to 
to rejoining you for some uh, live comments and reading your comments on Facebook and YouTube and at dognation.com. And, of course, for the moment, for those of you uh, who do tune in, don't forget to trust R.S. Sanders. If your water heater goes out in many cases, they can replace it for you the same day. There's nothing like, let's say, what I'm doing now, going on a vacation, and you get towards the time it's time to leave, and you, all of a sudden you have this you know weird thing pop up, some sort of water eater issue or some sort of plumbing issue. Well, R.S. Sanders can take care of you on all of that, give you the peace of mind you need to enjoy whatever you're trying to enjoy uh, in life. R.S. Andrews is there for you when it comes to your heating needs, electric needs, plumbing needs, everything else. R.S. Andrews online at rsandrews.com for all of that. We will see you back here tomorrow. It's Dog Nation Daily presented by Palo Window and Door of Georgia at 10 a.m. And then, of course, our uh, R.S. Andrews cool down after that and then back live again next week. Thanks for being here on the program. We'll look forward to talking to you then.